<laughs> today is the um, today is I think uh, you know I always lose track of time, which is great in one way. <clears throat> so today is Friday, May twenty sixth. I'm continuing our uh, conversations on discoveringyourcosmicself.com. The questions are from readers of You Are the Universe Discovering Your Cosmic Self and Why It Matters. The website is right here, discoveringyourcosmicself.com. And today's question is from Robin. And Robin asks, I would love the authors to weigh in on this question. How do we know? In my experience as a science writer, knowing comes from the scientific method. Hypotheses, test, assess, report on the facts, and await independent testing for con confirmation. That of course reflects knowing in the material world, which we now understand to be made up of qualia of human experience. Well, that part is totally correct. Uh, the scientific method no longer applies to measure the evidence of consciousness. In my experience as a fiction writer and explorer of consciousness, knowing comes to me in stillness, walks in nature, in prayer and in dreaming and waking states when I, when I set my mind free of the constraints of my conditioning. How do you experience it? Is it any less real for lacking evidence and replicable, replicability, how do we know it to be true? <clears throat> so Robin's question is very interesting in that it uh, displays a deep insight and also displays some misunderstanding by what we mean by knowing what we mean by knowing and also what we mean by truth. So there is something called relative truth and something called absolute truth. So let me explain this as best as I can. If I asked you what is this and you said it's a pen, <coughs> that's the relative truth. Once again, if I asked you what is this, um, and you said it's a pen, that's a relative truth. If I asked you what is this, and you said that's a hand, that's a relative truth. If I asked you what is this, and you said there's a place, uh, this is uh, glasses, eyeglasses, that's a relative truth. If I asked you what's this, you said it's a watch or a Fitbit, that's a relative truth. If I asked you, what's this? And you said, uh, that's a shirt, that's a relative truth. Radha, Kanan, and eight others shared your video. Radha, thank you so much for sharing the video and all my friends who are sharing the video, thank you. This is the only way we can expand our conversation. So, relative truth, this is a pen. What's the absolute truth? The absolute truth is this is the infinite being. 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 And everything that you see is, an, is the infinite being, but your experience of it right now anyway is that it's a pencil, it's a hand, it's a shirt, it's reading glasses, on and on. So, go back to modes of knowing. There are, Lisa Bhair says she shared. Thank you, Lisa. So let's go back to modes of knowing, okay? Let's go back to modes of knowing, which we've discussed before. So modes of knowing are being, feeling, thinking, reflecting, speaking, doing, and of course um, um, interpreting our 
experiences, our perceptual experiences. These are different modes of knowing. Never mind the scientific method, which is one mode of knowing, and it's also a relative mode of knowing because science depends on theories created in consciousness, conceived in consciousness, observations made in consciousness, and uh, and uh, experiments designed in consciousness. But let's go to very basic ways of knowing. Being. When you're just being without anything, then you are also uh, in a mode of knowing. And what do you know? You know yourself. You know yourself without uh, constructs at the level of being. Um, at the level of feeling and emotions, you know others, but you also know yourself because you can only know others at the level of feeling by resonating at the same frequency as their feelings or their emotions, by attunement and resonance. That's feeling. The level of, and it may not be another person, it could be an animal, it could be a cloud, it could be a rainbow, but you feel yourself in that experience. Uh, we call it beauty. If you feel that uh, yourself in another person, we call it love, but it's a mode of knowing. Okay. Then the third is um, uh, the mode of knowing that we call thinking. And this can be just dogmatic thinking based on a belief system into which we were indoctrinated or programmed. But, um, and that's what ideological knowing is, you know, whether uh, you're a Christian or a Jew, it's all conditioned knowing, ideological knowing that you were programmed into through a belief system. But at the level of knowing, there's also um, what we call reflective knowing. You know, you want to reflect on bigger questions. Who am I? What do I want? What's my purpose? What am I grateful for? What is my contribution? What kind of relationships do I want to have? What kind of world do I want to live in? On and on. There's so much reflective um, genius inside us and insight in us if we take the time to reflect. Then there's a mode of knowing that comes from speaking because when you speak, you elicit responses. And um, your mode of speaking determines the responses you get from your environment and therefore um, the, um, the um, mode of knowing that we get from uh, speaking is also uh, a mode of knowing uh, of ourselves. Because why? Because, you know, the responses we get are a reflection of who we are in every moment. And similarly with doing, every action creates a, a kind of a timeline that echoes back as what we call karma, and that is um, the modes of knowing that we obtain from actions. Now, Robin, of course, seems to imply anyway um, in her question that maybe the scientific method is more accurate no, it's not. It's more. It's it's just another system of thought that gives us um, uh, what we call empirical facts, but uh, what we call facts are modes of knowing in human consciousness and human awareness um, uh, through human perception and the perceptions that we intersubjectively agree about. Okay, so. Uh, that is scientific knowing. Theological knowing comes from contemplative practices and studying the insights of those we call contemplatives. And spiritual knowing comes from knowing yourself and religious knowing comes from the religious experience of others, frequently translated as dogma, etc. So you see all these modes of knowing are relative modes of knowing. What is absolute knowing? Let's, let's examine that in a, in a very precise manner.
this is an object that I call a pen. An object that I call glasses, reading glasses. An object that I call nose, an object that I call hand. So that's relative knowing and um, those are all knowings based on constructs. But let's go a little deeper. Can you separate this experience from the awareness in which this experience is happening? So one way is to call this an object, a pencil. Another way to refer to this object is a perceptual experience, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, etc., labeling it. So this is a perceptual experience, <coughs> seeing primarily right now for you. So can you separate the seeing of this from the awareness in which the seeing is happening? And the answer is obvious. You cannot separate this perceptual process from the seeing of it, in this case seeing. It could be touching, tasting, smelling, any, anything. But you cannot separate this from the seeing of it, and the seeing of it is in a witnessing awareness. Similarly, you cannot separate this from the experience of this, and the experience of this at this moment for you is the seeing of it, and the seeing of it is in witnessing awareness. Therefore, the two are united, connected. There is no object in the physical world which can be separated from the perception of it, and the perception of it is the experience of it, and the experience of it is the awareness in which that experiencing is occurring. Experiencing is an activity of awareness. And that awareness then has modified itself as this object, as this object, as this object, as this object, or what we call an object. In other words, all these objects, so-called objects, are awareness modifying itself as the experience that is localized and named as pencil, hand, shirt, face, nose. In other words, every object that you perceive is made out of awareness. Awareness, consciousness, being, which has no boundaries and which cannot be localized and which is totally formless. It is the light of awareness that brings every object into an experience of itself. You think you see a pencil or a watch or a pair of glasses or a nose or a hand, but it's the infinite that you perceive and you are that infinite awareness experiencing itself as that particular object. When you totally understand that, that there is only the infinite experiencing itself as all modes of knowing that are then labeled on given names and experienced as forms and phenomena, but it all the time is your own self, not yourself as your ego mind, but yourself in which even the ego mind is a pattern of behavior just like the body, or that which we call the body, is a pattern of behavior, or that which we call the universe is a pattern of behavior. When you see yourself in every object of experience, that is absolute truth. That is absolute knowledge. That is absolute knowledge. There is only you, the infinite being, 
experiencing itself as every object, every thought, every experience, every relationship, every circumstance, and the entire universe. That's why the title of the book is You Are the Universe. You Are the Universe. Aham Brahmasmi, the Sanskrit phrase, I am the universe, or Tattvamasi, you are that, all this is that, that alone is. And what is that? The infinite being. The infinite being, at the heart of it. When you can experience that, that is also called unity consciousness. It's beyond divine consciousness, beyond cosmic consciousness. And it is you and the universe. So Ramana Maharishi, a great teacher, used to say, the world is illusion, Brahman is the only reality. And then he would also say that the world is Brahman. Try and understand, the world is illusion. Illusion means it's a coming and going and a rising and subsiding of um, experiences and then ever propagating eternal now um, so it's the movie the screen is you on which the movie is being projected by the screen itself so you, you are perhaps you're sitting in the cinema looking at a movie and you forget that you're in the cinema because the movie is so good so the world is the movie on the screen of our consciousness and now of course the world um, includes the body-mind as well that's why it's illusion and Ramana Maharishi also said in this small non-dual teachers that Brahman is the only reality Brahman the infinite consciousness is the only reality and then he kind of seems to contradict himself by saying <clears throat> the world is Brahman he said already, the world is illusion. And now he's saying, the world is truth, Brahman. So you see, this is the paradox, the contradiction, the seeming contradiction, because there's nothing other than the infinite being, including its projections. There's nothing other than the infinite being, including its projections in time. But the infinite being being formless, is also timeless. So these days I've been focusing a lot on the experience of what we call flow and the flow experiences um, always timeless in the deep now, in the present. The flow experiences um, to just be without resistance, without regrets, without anticipation just this moment as it is and there is aliveness in that there's richness of experience in that richness of color and form and taste and smell and light and there is timelessness in that and there is effortless spontaneity in that and in that effortless spontaneity um, is intuition and creativity the right response to everything as it happens. When we live like that, we are living with absolute uh, truth. Sandra says, loving the self brings non-resistance. Yes, but the self is also the other. The self is also the other, as I've tried to explain right now. So here are two exercises that you can do to maybe set yourself up on this journey of knowing absolute truth. So take some time off um, to do this exercise. I have done it many times in New York City. I go around, I look at a bus, or I look at another person, I look at a tree, or I look at a pigeon, and 
I say to myself, I am that, I am that, I am that, I am that, that I am, I am that, that I am. Because every object that I see is an experience that cannot be separated from the awareness and is in fact a modified form of awareness. But then I take a break and I switch. I am not that, I am not that, I am not that, I am not that. Because both statements are equally true. I am that and I am not that. Both statements are equally true. I am that is absolute truth. I am not that is relative truth. Okay, because I am seeing myself as that or this is relative truth. The absolute truth is I am this. So this is what it means to, um, to be in the world and not of it. To be in the world and not of it is actually um, to totally understand reality, which appears in the relative world as sacred and profane, uh, sacred and profane, divine and diabolical, sinner and saint. These are the infinite dramas that um, the infinite being localizes itself as, as I said, sinner and saint, divine and diabolical, sacred and profane. Um, these are the dramas of Maya. These are the dramas of Maya. Maya is the veil. What's the veil? The veil is our conditioning. The veil is uh, um, what hides the truth. In a way, the veil is our mind, our conditioned mind, that gives us the experience of locality, while we have the knowingness of being non-local, eternal, timeless beings. Now, why is this important? Uh, I think it's only important if you want to know absolute truth. If you want to um, play in the relative realms of um, experience, then you know, then you can identify yourself as a soldier, as a leader, as an author, as a writer, as a terrorist, as uh, somebody who's uh, fighting for some ideal that you were conditioned to believe in. Oh Hilda, thank you for sharing this video and all others, 25 more people just joined uh, the conversation. Thank you for sharing this. I'd suggest you go back to this video a few times and let's expand in this conversation because you know, ultimately the goal of our life should be self-realization to understand that uh, birth and death are also relative truths and not absolute truths because the absolute truth is um, that the real self is never born and is not subject to death. That the real self is timeless, eternal, constantly self-expressing itself as infinite knowers, infinite modes of knowing and infinite objects known all within itself, all within itself. That's why, my dear friends, when I say you are the universe, you are the universe, I mean this as absolute truth. You are the universe. Relative truth, this is a book. Absolute truth, this is the infinite being appearing as a book and a person looking at the book. Those two are simultaneous processes in infinite being, which is you. Okay, all the methods of yoga help us get there, whether it is Raj Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Karma Yoga. And we can keep uh, uh, we can keep uh, pursuing this. Unless you're actually obsessed, obsessed with knowing the truth, it will escape you. 
and then you will be subject to the madness of the world, clinging and grasping, fear and aversion, identifying with a very small ego self, being afraid of death and old age and all the problems of the world that we create for ourselves and then collectively create for everyone else. Okay? Now I know some of you might disagree but that's also part of our relative truth because every point of view comes out of a context. Okay my friends, tomorrow, okay? We continue our discussions on You Are the Universe, Discovering Your Cosmic Self and I thank you for your support as well. Thank you.